Well, dear friends, please turn to Isaiah chapter 1. We'll be walking through the first verse of Isaiah today. And you might ask yourself, well, why are we in Isaiah? Aren't we supposed to be in Luke? And we have been in Luke. We've been in Luke for uh, over the last two years. We've, we've been in Luke. I didn't even realize it had been that long. And it's been an excellent journey through Luke. My desire is to continue to go through Luke. I have a desire to even walk through the uh, second portion of Luke's writing, which is the book of Acts. Remember, both of those were commissioned by the great uh, Theophilus. And I want to walk through both of those, but it's, it's good to vary what we're doing. Um, we practice systematic exposition of Scripture, and so we walk through books of the Bible in their entirety. Um, that's good because it forces you to deal with some passages that you would never normally deal with, some passages that maybe you would never intentionally choose to deal with. Maybe it might be bad because you have to deal with passages that you would never intentionally deal with. It's God's Word. It's a good thing. It's a blessing to walk through His Word. And even within the Scriptures, we have various genres. And um, other than in Sunday school, we did walk through the book of Jeremiah. Um, we, we've not preached through a large uh, book of the prophets previously, and Isaiah has been on my mind as we've walked through Luke, and I've, and I've really considered um, just the ways in which Isaiah has influenced the New Testament, and it's influenced the writers of the uh, New Testament. It's a, it's a book that is very evangelical. It's, there is, um, you can find the gospel in every book of the Bible, I'm convinced of that, but Isaiah in particular uh, has, has many things that we will see even in this overview sermon today of the book that speak of Christ and the gospel and the judgment of God and the grace that is offered to all who come to God repentant with faith in the Messiah to come. Jerome, <clears throat> many years ago, said this regarding um, Isaiah in his prologue and in commentary on the book, he said, he should be called an evangelist rather than a prophet because he describes all the mysteries of Christ and the church so clearly that you would think that he is composing a history of what's already happened rather than prophesying about what is to come. Isaiah is a very influential book in the New Testament, and I, I found this interesting. I was curious. Well, I know that Isaiah is quoted many times in the New Testament, but I never bothered to count them all. Even if I sought to do that, I'd probably get the number wrong. Um, Psalms is the most quoted book uh, in the New Testament. You probably already realize that. Uh, many times, even in the book of Romans, as Paul's going through Romans 3, and he's unpacking the consequences of sin, original sin, and uh, the depravity of man, he is quoting primarily from psalms, various psalms in um, the book of Psalms. So Psalms is the most quoted book from the Old Testament in the New Testament, but second to that, not surprisingly, is the book of Isaiah. Psalms is quoted 68 times. Isaiah is quoted 55 times. Next after that is Deuteronomy 44 times, Genesis 35 times, Exodus 31 times, Leviticus 13, Proverbs 8 Zechariah 7, Hosea 6, and Jeremiah 5. So you see, even in comparison to the other books that are quoted in the New Testament from the Old Testament, Isaiah is quoted many times more than most of the other books. Entire chapters speak in great specific detail regarding the Messiah to come. Its influence, even great works like, like Handel's Messiah, um, Isaiah 52, I'm going to be reading from larger portions of Isaiah, just thematic ones that you're familiar with, but Isaiah 52, beginning in 13, speaking of the Messiah to come, speaking of Christ who is to come. We have one of the most descriptive passages regarding Jesus, who He is, and what He would do. Second to this, or similar to this, would be Psalm 22 in its specificity regarding Jesus and what will happen to him. Let's consider what it says here, Isaiah 52, beginning in 13. 
It says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. And so shall he sprinkle many nations, kings, shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told, then they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like the root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed, esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he has poured out his soul in death. And was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many. And makes intercession for the transgressors. One of the most fantastic passages in all of Scripture. Is here within Isaiah. Isaiah. One of the passages that we could walk through and find numerous places where it is pointing to Jesus and who it is and, and what it is that he would do and why it is he was able to do what he was able to do. Such a passage cannot be assumed to be talking about the Jewish people as a whole as a way in which this passage is interpreted by some. They will look at the ways in which Jews have been persecuted over the years and attempt to interpret this passage in this light. No. This passage is talking about the one the Lord would send. This passage is talking about the suffering servant that would bear the iniquity for his people. The one that would be cast off. And then even such specificity thrown in there that his grave was with that of transgressors. He'd be buried in the grave of a rich man. Remembering it was Joseph of Arimathea who would loan his tomb to Jesus. So much that can be gleaned from this beautiful passage pointing to Jesus and who it is and what he would do contained here within Isaiah. There's many other places we could point to that may not be as long as this passage, but many other places that will point to this Messiah to come. This overwhelming reminder that although Judah and Israel are going through these difficulties, 
Although there is inconsistency with the leadership that they have, although the economy may be going up and down, although troubles from warring nations may be creeping in, the Lord would make all things right. He would send His chosen one. He would bring an account to all things. He would save His people. Israel will ultimately be saved. That is the emphasis of this book. And Israel being those who are called out, those who are chosen by God. The reality is that we talk about this term Israel, we're talking about God's people, and we need to understand that theme as we're going through here. At times, we do understand that to be talking about a particular ethnic people. But when Paul says something like, not all who are of Israel are Israel, he's talking about the true people of God, the the chosen people of God, the ones that the Lord will preserve and preserve to the end and preserve in the end. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, many times you have the word Israel translated as ekklesia. You may not know what that word means. Ekklesia is the term that is used in the New Testament for church. So there's no church in the Old Testament. Well, the translators of the Old Testament into Koine Greek believed that was the appropriate term for Israel in multiple places, and that is those who are called out. And those called out ones, those ones that are called out to be distinct and different, those ones for whom this Messiah has come and laid down His life for a specific people, are those who will be preserved, and we'll see that as we walk through this this book. Let's look at this first verse. Well, this is the superscription. This is the introduction to the book. This book will introduce itself. It will be introduced in this first chapter. This first chapter will be almost a thesis statement for the book of Isaiah. But this first verse is an introduction to the introduction. It's telling you about who is giving this prophecy, where it's coming from, when it's happening, and what it is. Isaiah 1.1, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now, this will not only consider Judah and Jerusalem, it will consider the northern kingdom as well. There will be times where four nations are being dealt with, but the focus on this is upon the people of God, His called out ones, His distinct ones. This is a vision that is given to Isaiah. It's a prophecy that is given to the prophet Isaiah. And when we see the word vision, we don't need to understand this in a way that he's just sitting back with his eyes rolled back, getting some kind of a message, and then writing that message down quickly. No, he's likely going out and giving this information, and then he's writing it down. That's a common way that prophets would have done things. When when we read here that he's going to the king and speaking to the king, he didn't write that down ahead of time and then go and do that. He's writing that down afterward. That's just a reasonable way of understanding what's happening. He would have given these messages. He would have put this together. He would have added a beginning and an end. He would have added this first statement. He would have added this first chapter, and it wasn't necessarily written um, the way that it's in existence now, but it was, would have been put together in that way to communicate a certain point. But we have here the, a special revelation. God speaking to a prophet. God speaking to a holy man that was inspired by the Spirit of God to give a particular message. God speaks to all people everywhere. All people know there is a God. All people see the evidence of God. That is in general revelation. We see that 
communicated in the very first chapter, in the very first paragraph of the Second London Baptist Confession of 1689. It says, the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. Although the light of nature, the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give the knowledge of God and His will which is necessary unto salvation. General revelation tells you that God exists. General revelation tells you that God is wise, that He is good, that He is powerful. It is all around you. You can't deny it. You can't say it just happened. You can't say nothing became something and it blew up and became everything. That is foolishness. That is completely absurd. There is sufficient evidence in the creation all around you to condemn you. There's not sufficient evidence in the creation around you whereby you can be saved. God must reach out to man. God must pursue man. God must speak in a special way to man. That's why it continues in that first paragraph. It says, Therefore, it pleased the Lord at sundry times in diversified manners to reveal Himself and to declare that His will unto His church and afterward for the better preserving and propagating of the church and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh, the malice of Satan, and of the world to commit the same holy unto writing which makes the holy scriptures to be most necessary, these former ways of revealing his will unto his people being now completed. The Lord must give special revelation. The special revelation is given and that it is contained within writing that it may be a blessing for those in the future. If you want to hear from God, read your Bible. If you want to hear from God audibly, read your Bible out loud. That's why it says, I, didn't, I stole that from Justin Peters, by the way. He probably stole it from someone else. But it says that in the confession here, and it says those former ways being now completed. You hear from God by hearing His Word proclaimed. You hear from God by reading His Word. You hear from God Please remember this, church, as we're gathered together and we are, we are singing, you are teaching others the will of God. You're teaching others the Word of God as you are singing. We are intentional in how we choose songs. We're not choosing songs just so we elicit some particular feeling that you will have as you're singing it. I, I hope you do have feelings as you're singing. We're not trying to be like without any emotion, but there's a message that is there, and you are participating in proclaiming that to others. The church is gathering together and declaring these truths. That's why it's important that we sing that which is true, that we sing that, is, that which is edifying, that which is beneficial. This is special revelation. This is the Word of God. We're declaring things about God. John Calvin makes this point about this first verse. He says, the inscription of Isaiah recommends to us the doctrine of this book as containing no human reasonings but the oracles of God in order to convince us that it contains nothing but what is revealed by the Spirit of God. He's not bringing forward his personal opinions or his preferences. I'd say there's probably a great many things that we'll see Isaiah do in this book that may not have been his preferences. I don't know if you've read some of the prophets and what they've had to do. I mean, Ezekiel was given some incredible commands from God that he had to do to, to demonstrate to the people what was going to happen to them when they were invaded, when they were being taken into exile. This is God speaking through this man. He's speaking through this man as a, a prophet He's also one who seems that he is, is in some way connected to royalty. Um, from what we can tell, Amos is believed to be in the royal line. Um, there certainly is an Amos in, in the royal line. It seems reasonable that that would be um, the father of Isaiah. 
Um, there's, some other, there's some other evidence as well that he's in some way connected to royalty because he seems to have the ability to just kind of go in and out of the royal court. He seems to have the ability to walk in and, and speak to kings and really have no repercussions for the most part. For the most part, he, he does not. Unlike Jeremiah, remember Jeremiah, he's getting thrown into cisterns, he's getting put into stocks, he's getting beaten at other times. He was persecuted for the prophecies that he gave and for what he spoke to the, the leaders. You don't see that in Isaiah. Isaiah seems to have preferential uh, treatment and not receiving any immediate consequences. Now, tradition does say, the tradition as taught it's, uh, in the, in the t- Jewish Talmud, it says that Isaiah died as a martyr. It said he was sawn in half. Um, this isn't in the Bible. Um, however, there is a prophet that was sawn in half that's spoken of in the Bible. Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 37, speaking of the prophets of old, it says they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. Uh, they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground, and all these having um, gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. I believe that's a reference to Isaiah, the one who was sawn in in half. Um, it, it teaches, uh, it, it, the tradition says that um, it's Manasseh, King Manasseh, the evil and terrible King Manasseh, the worst king it is believed that Judah ever had, uh, that um, he, was, he was going after Isaiah, and Isaiah hid in a tree, and they cut the tree in half with him inside of it. Other early church leaders believe that, Tertullian, Justin Martyr, and others uh, believe that this was, this was Isaiah. They believe this is credible. I don't know for sure. Um, it seems reasonable, since we have this in the New Testament, uh, that we could put these two things together. Um, Isaiah never mentions Manasseh. That's something that's, that's a fascinating detail that we have here. He, it seems that he was certainly alive during the time of Manasseh, and the question as to why he didn't name him specifically when he was... Um, naming other people at that time. It could be that he didn't recognize his legitimacy as a king. He was, a, he was an absolute terrible king, um, son of Hezekiah, one of the great kings of the past in Judah, probably um, as far as holiness, one of the holiest kings, and led them in prosperity um, and walking in, in righteousness. Um, had a son named Manasseh that did the very opposite, led them into polytheistic worship. Um, this book seems to be broken up based on um, basically eras or, or time frames. Um, you have this chapter 1 through chapter 5, going to about verse 30 in chapter 5, addresses uh, Uziah and uh, Jotham, those, those leaders that are there, and um, Judah and, and Israel. And then from chapter 6 through 14, you've got Jotham and, and Ahaz and then at the end, you have Hezekiah and 14 through 66, through most of it there, Hezekiah. And I believe to be Manasseh at this point. I believe that he was around during that time. Um, I think that's reasonable. Manasseh is not mentioned in here, and that's something that will stand as something that's interesting. He, he served as a prophet for about 40 years, very long tenure as a prophet, about the same time that Jeremiah served as as a prophet. And this book begins at a time of great uh, prosperity for the time of Israel, um, a time during uh, the King Uzziah, um, Uzziah, Uzziah, however you want to say it. He was one who was a very prosperous king. He led them um, to great peace with foreign nations. He led them in a time for, with uh, great economic prosperity. And so they were doing very, very well. And this puts us around the time of 700 B.C., just to walk through kind of a historical idea. 900 B.C. would be kind of David and Solomon, Elijah and Elisha. That would have been about 800 B.C. The reign of Ahab and Jezebel was right after that. And here we are at this time, 
coming into around 700 B.C. into the, the 600s. Um, and that's the, the place where we are here, this time of great economic prosperity, these times where God has shown himself in times before and the people have repented and they're um, living on the blessings of the repentance of other people. But they themselves, their hearts are beginning to fall away. They, they are falling away. Uh, another theme that we have in this book is that of idolatry. And he's going to be dealing with in these early portions those who are practicing their religion, but their heart is not in it. Those who are outwardly practicing their religion, rather, um, but it's not affecting their lives. They're, they're not, not a people that are changed. There's still this, this shell of a religion that is existing based upon things that happened previously, but it's having no real effect on the life, and the consequence of that is that um, what's inside begins to um, demonstrate itself outside. And you have within this one of the most famous passages on the topic of idolatry and the, the foolishness of idolatry. We must not look at a passage like this and only consider it in regard to someone who's making a and fashioning a stone or a wood idol, though that is the context of this passage. But all idolatry is going to fall into this category that it does not profit. It has the allure. Right? It, it looks as though it will provide, but it has no ability to do that. Idolatry is a dead religion. Isaiah 44, beginning in verse 9, speaks on this theme. And he says this, All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know that they may put, be put to shame. Who fashions a god or cast an idol that is profitable for nothing? He's asking the question, why would you do this? It can't do anything for you but yet you're putting all this effort into it. Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame, and the craftsmen are only human. Let them all assemble. Let them stand forth. They shall be terrified. They shall be put to shame together. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with a hammer and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry, and his strength fails. He drinks no water. And is faint. The carpenter stretches a line, marks it out, cuts with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into a figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He cuts down cedars or chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for man. He takes part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he bakes a god and worships it. He makes an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god. His idol falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. They know not, nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes so they cannot see, and their hearts so they cannot understand. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, Half of it I burned in the fire. I also baked bread on its coals. I roasted meat and have eaten, and shall I make of the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? In other places, he speaks of these idols that have legs and cannot walk, arms, and cannot do anything with them. Mouths, they cannot speak. This is idolatry. Idolatry is a theme throughout this book. Idolatry, something we need to be mindful of. The idols of the culture in which you dwell are those that you are most likely to be blinded to. 
It's those that we don't realize. It's, as the saying goes, the fish doesn't realize that he is wet. You're just here. You're just amongst it. And the people at this time existed in this time and didn't notice what was happening, and God sent them a prophet. They were abandoning their God, but they continued to practice their religion. And we see that in these beginning portions of the book, the economic success that they received, the blessings that God had given to them, they were using to sin against God even more and more. And that's not the end of the story. Another theme that you will see throughout this book is the judgment and salvation of Israel, that God has a plan for His people, that He has a people that He has called out. He has a people that He will save, but He will save them in His justice. He will save them according to His holiness. Gordon Fee makes this point regarding this beginning portion of the book. It says, Isaiah begins his address in a typical ancient Near Eastern treaty style by invoking heaven and earth as witnesses to an indictment in which the overlord God states his case against his vassal, Judah, whose people have violated the moral covenant he established with them through Moses at Mount Sinai. You see this in the prophets many times. The prophet will go to the people and will begin to bring charges against them. Like, like a lawyer is going forward. Like a lawyer is bringing charges against someone, laying down evidence. And prior to bringing the evidence, they begin to bring in their, their witnesses to attest to what the person has done. Isaiah will call in creation to recognize these covenantal violations, the ways in which Israel is violating the covenant of their Lord, the Lord that has saved them. Remember, this was something that was understood by the people at this time. When you had a leader that saved you out of slavery to another leader, you were then subject to that leader, and you would be given... Uh, certain requirements. There would be a covenant that was made between the people and that leader. And Israel was saved out of the clutches of slavery in Egypt. They were freed from the slavery of Egypt, and they were freed so that they would not live under the yoke of Pharaoh any longer. They would not live under that bondage that they were under. That's a continual struggle, fight for Israel for all of its time so they continued to go back to this idolatry. We saw that so soon after they were removed from Egypt. So soon after they were removed. They're, they're holding around them the, the gold that was given to them. That, that these, the judgment of God fell upon the gods of Egypt. And these plagues fell upon Egypt. And it came to a point where the people of Egypt were saying, leave Go, get out of here. You, you are harmful to us. And they began to take their, their wealth, their gold, and just give it to them. Just please take our money and leave. And Israel is here having seen all of the works of God, seen God defeat the gods of Egypt. And the people of Israel are standing there as Moses is up on Mount Sinai, receiving the law from God. And they're standing there with this wealth they go and fashion, encourage Aaron to fashion an idol for them. And they begin to worship the God that saved them, the way in which they worship the false gods in Egypt. Remember that. He makes this idol, this golden calf. Do you like what he says? I just threw it in the fire and it came out. No, that's not what happened, Aaron. You formed that. You fashioned it. You you made that. But when he created that golden calf, he told them, this is the God that saved you out of Egypt. See, they didn't go worship the false gods of Egypt. They began to worship the God that saved them in a way in which they were not supposed to worship him. They were bringing these bad habits, these bad religious practices 
forward in worshiping the true God falsely. And Isaiah is going to bring these charges forward, as so many other prophets do. Isaiah is going to call witnesses forward, calling the witness of creation to testify against them. We'll see that in the next sermon as we walk through these first few uh, verses in Isaiah, beginning in verse 2 of chapter 1. He says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They are not pressed up or bound up or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overgrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field like a besieged city. It's the charges that are bring, being brought before them, being brought to Israel by the prophet, and the theme of God's judgment will continue to flow here. And it deals specifically here with Israel and their violations of the covenant on Sinai. But we see any time we see the judgment of God, the Reminder that there is a judgment to come, that God is going to judge all people everywhere, that all are going to give an account for their lives and how they have lived. Because all of us sinned in Adam, and all of us were born dead in our trespasses and sins, and all of us have been affected by sin. All of us stand as violators of the covenant. All of us have these charges over us. Creation will give an account before God. Those who have violated His covenant, we are made in the image of God. And being made in the image of God, we are designed to walk according to His Word, to walk according to His law. And so here in Isaiah, many times over, we can see the ways in which this focuses specifically on the people at this time in other times applies generally to all people that there's a judgment to come because you're going to have Isaiah focus on the past, the present, and the future. And that theme is going to flow through various parts and ultimately in the end it's going to be very much future-oriented. There's eschatological hope that is there that God's going to reign all things in and make all things right. But these things will happen in a way that is consistent with God's character and nature. And there's very strong theology regarding the doctrine of God within the book of Isaiah. And a very important passage on that, which we will shortly get to, is in Isaiah 6, this famous passage where Isaiah is called into ministry at the time when King Uzziah dies. Uzziah dies in this time of political upheaval and turmoil is happening, where people are saying, this person has been leading us for 50 years. What are we going to do now? Who will reign? Who will lead in that time of upheaval? There is one who's sitting on his throne. There is one who is not concerned. There is one who is not worried, not fretting at all. Isaiah, Uzziah has come and he has gone the Lord is still sitting on His throne. You see this beautiful passage in Isaiah 6, beginning in verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon His throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. We see God's glory displayed even in that first verse of this chapter. His magnificence, His glory as He sits reigning, His power 
It says, train of the robe is filling the temple. The glory of God is filling this temple. We see God's omnipresence displayed here. Second verse, above him stood seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And the one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And we see the glory here even of God's creation. As these seraphim, these, these fiery ones, that's what the terminology means, these fiery, powerful angels, which as they speak, the foundations begin to shake. And what you take from that is, if these seraphim are so powerful, how much more powerful is the one who created them? How much more glorious and powerful is the one to whom they are praising and glorifying we have the statement that holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And R.C. Sproul, in his famous sermon and book on this passage, points out this is the only attribute of God which is stated three times in a row. And we understand that, that God's attributes aren't things that are all separated and partitioned off, but we do and can understand that God's holiness is something that affects every other attribute in a very defining way, that He is above all else holy. He is distinct. He is separate from, He is different from us. He is distinct from His creation. There is a creator-creature distinction that is communicated in this praise that is given to God by these seraphim, that holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And Isaiah sees God's glory. Isaiah sees the glory of this creation, likely trembles as they even speak. And in seeing God and His glory, he sees his own sin. Look at what he says in the next verse. Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He sees the glory of God. He sees God in His righteousness, His distinctness. Even through a veil, He's not seeing God as He actually is. God is spirit. But He's seeing God as God is displaying Himself to Him at this time in a way in which Isaiah can even understand. In seeing God, He sees His sin. He sees His distinctness. Isaiah, before this, probably could have looked around and seen the, the sin of the leaders and seen the sin of others around him and thought higher of himself than he should. And he likely didn't sin in the ways in which some of these others did. But in seeing God in his glory, he saw his hopelessness. He said, woe is me, for I am lost. I am in trouble. I am a dead man. I see God in His glory, and I have spoken things that are profane. I have said things that are untrue, and I live amongst the people who says profane things, who acts in profane ways. You see this important piece there, this repentance. Isaiah sees this. He sees his problem. He sees the bad news. We have this beautiful picture in verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar and touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. And this theme that we have throughout this book many times over that we will see the judgment of God and the salvation of Israel flows not with God just waving a magic wand and all of the problems going away or just letting the sin go as though it never 
happened, but this being something that is atoned for. And though these things may be hid behind a veil, we can see from this side the ways in which the light of the Messiah to come is shining through the veil that we have even within this prophetical writing of Isaiah. That there would be one who would come, that there would be one who would bear the transgressions of the people. The wrath of God would fall upon him, and the people would come from him and be blessed. He will see his offspring, this one that was dead, this one that the wrath of God fell upon. The same passage says he will see his offspring. He will see those that come from him, which are the people of God, the ones who will be saved. That is the only means, dear friend, that you can have salvation that God may be just and justifier. The theme that we see flowing throughout this, that God is a just God. He is a holy God. He can in no way act in a way that is contrary to His righteousness and holiness. But God is also a loving, merciful, and kind God. And He showed that love to us through Christ, the one who was to come the one who did come, the one who defeated death and the grave, that all who come to him may have life, that all who come to him may be saved. I pray this will be a blessing as we walk through this study, as we walk through these themes that are here. I pray that you will see the ways in which these truths are, were displayed So many years earlier, I pray that you will see the ways in which God has been working in the life of His people, has been saving people by grace and through faith, the theme that we see in Hebrews chapter 11. Be praying as we walk through this study. I believe this will be good. It will be a blessing for you, and I think it will be a blessing for me very much. Even this preliminary study has been fruitful and a blessing. Let's go to the Lord.